Well, I want to thank you all for inviting me here. And it's a beautiful place. I'd never been to Alaska before. And we've enjoyed every minute here. And I've been so impressed with the students and the faculty. There's um, a liveliness to this program. And it's, it's very impressive, very impressive. Uh, I want to talk today about journalism and climate change, but it's also a little broader than that. It's about journalism in general and how journalism has changed so much in the last decade and how that is affecting us and how that is affecting, I think, the debate over climate change. And it concerns me and I would like to be able to paint a rosy picture. I'm a pretty upbeat person normally but uh, it's of great concern right now. So I wanted to begin by telling you a little bit about my career because it turns out that my career, you know, sometimes we're living through history, we don't realize it. And I have been part of this and I was part of the old newspaper world and I watched it go down and by luck I ended up staying with it and so I'm now thrust into this new era of insecurity really is what it is and so when I'm in and, and I think this will help you if I can tell you a little bit about the past those of you who aren't journalists you will understand more about what's going on in the present and when I became a journalist I became a journalist by accident, which I think many people do, they, and it's like you find your tribe of people, um, and you find them by accident. And in my case, and I think I mentioned this in one of the classes, an English teacher, my freshman English teacher at the University of Oklahoma, who was a graduate student who clearly did not want to be there. And we had to write a theme, and at the end of the theme, he asked me, when, after he had looked at the papers, he asked me to stay after class. And he looked at me and he said, I know you copied this. He said, it's too good, and I know you didn't write it. And no one <laughs> had ever accused me of cheating. I was, you know, sort of this kind of girl. And, but I thought, wow. If someone thinks I can write well enough that they think I cheated, <laughs> maybe I should become a journalist. <laughs> and up until then, my, um, my major was going to be library science because I loved books. And I just thought that if you loved books, you should become a librarian. <laughs> I mean, I never thought about journalism. So this is, this is no exaggeration. I walked out of the, the English department and I asked someone on campus where is the journalism school someone told me where it was I walked in and there was um, the, a wonderful woman who was the secretary of the school and I went up to her and I said I think I want to be a journalist <laughs> and she said oh Dr. Holland who was the the head of the school has a free moment just walk right into his office <laughs> so <laughs> Dr. Holland talked to me and he asked me what I liked. I knew nothing, I mean, clearly nothing. And I told him how much I liked books and everything. And he said, we'll put you in the area of professional writing, which means short stories and novels. And now after I've had children and I think, oh my God, this man put me on a career path to, do, to be a, a mooch on my parents for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Because, you know, you don't go off and think I'm going to support myself by writing short stories and novels. But what happened, um, I did. They had a very wonderful school of professional writing at that time. And I delayed all my journalism, my real journalism courses, till my junior year. And then I took them all and became editor of the newspaper. And I loved it, of course. But the thing that I want to stress about this is I found my tribe in that school. They were people like me. They were people who were curious about the world. They weren't the people who uh, necessarily fit in. I would say most of them were very shy, but when they had a notebook or something, then they could be braver. And they wanted to do good things. They wanted to tell good stories for people. I can't say everyone wanted to change the world, but 
they wanted to tell, they wanted to reflect experiences. They wanted to figure out things and then share those experiences with, with other people, whether they're happy experiences or bad experiences. So what I realized later, looking back on that, is journalists of that era, and I think up until recently, it was almost like joining a religious order without the vowels or anything. You, you went in, you, at that time, you did not expect to be rich. You assumed you would be poor. No one, you know, this was before celebrity journalists were all over the place. The, that, that was not, uh, at, at the peak of your career, you might work at the New York Times, but even then, your face would not be known. It would be your byline. And so you went with that expectation. And along the way, as you perfected your craft, you were with others who had this same mission. And as you went up from newspaper to newspaper, most of us went from little papers to bigger papers, or you stayed at a smaller paper, which some wonderful journalists do, and deepen their craft right there and really dig into their communities. But whatever route we chose, we would focus on two things. In one, there was an ethical expectation there. You did not associate yourself with the people that you were writing about. You accepted nothing from them. You, there was a clear barrier. Someone sent me flowers once. I had written about a profile. I was a TV critic for a while. And uh, so I had written a profile of someone and he sent me flowers. And it was as if I had a hot ball of fire in my hands. And literally, I remember running across the street. There was a church across the street from the newspaper building. And I said, flowers, <laughs> uh, you know, because you couldn't, you, you know, this was your um, shield. It was, it, it protected you and it made your work um, you could tell people ethically, I'm not affiliated with these people. I, don't, I, I didn't accept a Coke. And so someone gave me, um, I did a story on the Weather Channel when they first opened, and um, I spent the day with their PR person, and this was a long time ago. The, the Weather Channel was this brand new cable thing that no one thought would last. And, um, and at the end, and, and so I got back home, my story ran, and I, she later sent me a pen. It was a Weather Channel pen. It wasn't a terribly expensive pen, but it had my name on it. They had to have a meeting at my newspaper to know if I could keep the pen with my name on it. I didn't care about that pen. I really wanted to distance myself from that pen. But um, that's how, you know, it's a, a funny thing now, but it was something that, was part of this world that we bought into. The other thing that we bought into was the integrity of our work. And when I say, I want to tell you a little about the vetting process. And those of you who've worked at newspapers and are part of newspapers, you'll see this very clearly. But when I will use my years at the Union Tribune, if I, if I was an editor and if one of my reporters had a story going on A1. This is the process that would happen. The reporter and I would discuss it. The reporter would write it. I would edit it. And I'm a sort of an obsessive editor, so it would be really edited. Then it would be read by the section editor. Then it would probably be read by the managing editor. And all these people are giving back comments. You know, you might do this, or have you thought about this? Then it would be read, if it was a sensitive story, it be, would be read by the top editor. And then it would, might be read by the A1 editor, who was editing all the copy for that day. And then it would go to the copy desk, and it would be read by a copy editor, and after that, it would be read by the copy desk chief. So, yes, mistakes were made. 
and because we're all human and, and I have made my share there, you know, we do dumb things. Usually they're dumb mistakes that you, but you try. The system was constructed to try. So as I went through my career, I went from job to job and I went, um, I ended up at the Union Tribune and I went there in 1994 and it was really a paper that was flexing its muscle. The editor there, Karen Winner, um, really wanted to do good things. And for a while, it was really a golden time. And, and we experimented. It's a very, it was a conservative paper. It's known as the owners were Republicans. And, um, and it was known as a very conservative paper, but the editorial side was totally separate from the newsroom. I think I had worked there a year before I met anyone on the editorial side. They were on a different floor. I didn't even know what they looked like. So, you know, there was this clear separation and we did some wonderful things and some really fine reporters were there. So we're doing this great work and Along comes the Randy Duke Cunningham story, and we win the Pulitzer Prize. And Randy Duke Cunningham was a congressman from San Diego. He was a World War II hero. He had been reelected many, many times, and he was taking bribes. And he was not very bright. And he even wrote down one of the bribes on a napkin. So, um, and, and so we exposed this, one of our reporters who now is actually working, I'm working with him again, um, and Marcus Stern led the team. And I was just, I was one of many editors on, on that project. But I remember the day that we won the Pulitzer Prize and I was in the newsroom and no one really thought we would win. We hadn't won anything in a long, long time, and it just, it just seems so uh, uh, impossible. And so in those days, you watched the, the, your, the terminal to see, and as AP, you know, released the names. And when we won, it was this amazing moment. But I also remember standing there and thinking, Either this is the moment when we're really, as a newspaper, going to take this and realize that we can do great things and we're going to go forward, or this is going to be as good as it gets. And I, I really thought that at that moment. And unfortunately, that was as good as it was ever going to get. And the, the trip backwards was so terrible and it happened so fast that it was hard to conceive. And um, for me personally, I decided to leave the Union Tribune um, because even though the people above me were not saying it in so many words, the financial pressures were coming in and they were all under stress. And there was one time that I, I still remember uh, clearly where I realize now it's the time when I, it, it finally prompted me to leave, was one of my reporters had written a wonderful story. It was the kind of story newspaper people dream of where he had written a story about the city attorney and it ended up the city attorney was not reelected and that story really had a lot to do with it. And it was a meticulously reported story but it was also an entertaining story to read. And to combine those two things is so rare. And he left um, not that long after that. He went to the Wall Street Journal and was immediately writing for the front page of the Wall Street Journal. He was that good. But I was called into a meeting and every, all these top editors were sitting there and they were looking at me like this and they were, um, and they said, we wanna know why you let him write this story this way and because the story is so good that we can't cut it. And if, and if we run a story this long, again, they, it was not long by the earlier standards. If we run a story this long, that it will give other reporters the idea that they too can write stories like this. 
And it was such a surreal experience, but now I empathize with all those people because now I know what was going on. The news hall was shrinking. They had X number of inches to play with. If that story would have, it was about, for the newspaper people, it was about a 75 inch story, which meant it needed a full page. It would start on the front and it needed a page inside. But we had done many stories with two pages inside. So, and this was, you know, in our sweet spot. To the paper's credit, the story ran. It was not cut. It was a great story. It did what it was supposed to do. But I think inside me, I, I knew that things were changing. So they offered a buyout. I took the buyout. And here's where my story sort of swings into the present because it's, I took the buyout. Well, pretty soon after that, people were being laid off in waves. Some of my best reporters, you know, just gone very fast. And, but I'm sitting there thinking my journalism days are done. And I got this call from ProPublica on the same day. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I ended up at ProPublica, which was to me heaven, because it was a place where, and it still is, where deeper, more thorough, better is the rule. And asking questions is the way into the future. And what they want are the more complex stories, where nothing is too difficult to tackle. And where there was this room full of people, everyone was, is very smart there. And they've also selected people who are also very good with, at working with other people. There, it's not a room full of prima donnas where you know you have the journalists who are now the celebrities. The, the people that they've hired are not like that. And so if I had a question, I could walk out and someone knew the answer. If I needed to know how to do something, someone had the answer. So it was truly wonderful. But at the same time, we were realizing things at ProPublica that surprised even us. And one of the things we realized at the beginning, we thought, oh, newspapers will love it. We can save them money. We are going to be doing these bigger investigative projects, and we will come to you, dear newspaper, and we will give you this project for free. You don't have to, you know, your staff doesn't have to do anything. What we learned right off the bat is they didn't have the news hole for our big projects. And it was clear that that era of newspaper journalism was shrinking. At the same time, uh, the reporters who were capable of producing that kind of work were being laid off. So I was at ProPublica for three years. And it was three years, for my way of thinking, it was what journalists dream of. And I got to do it. And we did. I was one of many editors on Sherry Fink's story, but her book is really good, and I would recommend it. Five Days at Memorial. Did I get the tie? Five Days at Memorial. It's a great. She wrote a book, and it, it just came out uh, a few months ago. She, it's been reviewed by the New York Times. Everybody. It's a wonderful book, and it's about uh, Hurricane Katrina, and one of the hospitals that was left stranded. And she had written the piece that won the Pulitzer was. Uh, a very abridged version of this. And then she has spent several years reporting deeper. And so now there's a, a giant book. It's a great book for book clubs, too, I think. Lots of fodder there for discussion. So, so my husband, we had a, an agreement that we would go back to California after three years in New York. And um, I wanted to stay. He wanted to leave. But we, so we left. And um, so I ended up getting a job with something called Inside Climate News, right there, um, which was at the time called Solve Climate News. And at the time, they were about four years old. And it had started as a blog. The publisher, David Sassoon, is really brilliant. He's, uh, I, I've been lucky because to work with it's, it's wonderful to be able to work with really smart people where you can throw out ideas and, and go back and forth like this. And I had that at ProPublica, and I have that again. Um, 
and he asked me if I wanted to come on board and they were really tiny and they were just trying to find their journalism legs and they had a really good managing editor but you know they they hadn't done the kind of work that ProPublica does so I said sure I would love to do that and so of course the story of the time is for them for for our site is climate change it should be the story of our time for everybody in the country and in the world I I happen to believe so so there we are seven people you know we can't ProPublica has about 40 more than 40 now I think people we're this little teeny group um, we changed our name to Inside Climate News because Solve made it sound um, a little more presumptuous as though we had solutions and um, the best we can hope for I think is to present the problems and then hope others have the solutions but so we changed the name and we ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize for a project that um, the, the mainstream media really missed. And although that turned out well for us, it isn't good for journalism. And the fact that we did it, uh, people didn't read it still. We're tiny. Have you, I mean, has anyone here ever heard of us before you heard me of me coming? Oh, I, I'm, really, I'm really pleased that, because we're small. You know, we're, we, we, we're not the New York Times, and um, even when we go to interview people, we still have to remind them. Then once we get them in our corner, we're fine. But we're tiny, and we're trying to do things that are very important, and now the mainstream media, what's left of it is missing. And so what you have, the good and the bad of the times, the good part of this is that you have freedom with little sites like ours, specialized sites, where dedicated journalists are really pouring their hearts into it, which is what our people do, they really do. And we're using all of the ethical standards where, where nothing deviates. There's every single thing that I learned is what we do. They do it instinctively. We have a mix of young journalists and then some older people who have experience. So you have sites like ours, and then you have blogs, talking heads, people spitting out, reporters spitting out for websites three stories a day that are you know this long. And as a reader, I feel this way. You know, it's all coming at you, and there's no filter. There's no organization. Uh -huh. Um, and so I think for readers, you're left to pick your way through all of this stuff. You don't have, people have, still have good newspapers, and actually the paper here and the paper in Anchorage, we were so, my husband and I, we buy papers everywhere we go, and we're so impressed because both are better than the, the San Diego Union Tribune is now, uh, both. And, the Union Tribune now, they, the reporters, um, you know, it, it's just a harder, um, it's a harder place. It's not run by journalists. And, and I think the owner doesn't believe in climate change. And it, it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different place. So, but here we still have, we, we've read the papers every day. We're, we're real impressed. So, but even here, I hear that the Anchorage paper it used to be, better, bigger, deeper. Right, so, so who is picking up the slack? And if climate change is what the scientists say it is, how do we get enough people to understand this so that we can begin acting? And that's something that my people think about all of the time. Um, how do we tell the stories? How do, we, um, how do we grab the attention? And we're so tiny. And I can give you an example of a story right now that's going on. There's a, a gubernatorial election in Florida. 
Charlie Crist and um, Rick Scott. And it's a very interesting race that we are covering from the climate perspective. Because even though it has gotten very little mention there, this is a pivotal election for the state of Florida. Because Charlie Crist, when he was governor, belie he believes in climate change and he did, he started putting things into place. And apparently, Rick Scott came in, when he came into office, he took those things apart and said they weren't necessary. And he does not accept the reality that there is climate change. And if anyone here is a scientist, you know Florida is the state, I think it's considered the, the most at-risk state. And it's not even just the coastline, but the whole water supply system there is at risk in the inland too, because of the, the unique geology there. So this is barely even being mentioned. And so one of our reporters is doing this story. And she is detailing, and I think the story will be up in the morning if all goes well. And, but she's been working on this for about a week. And she, um, she is showing what happened when Chris was in office. And this is, it's not that we're supporting Chris. We don't know anything about him. In fact, he hasn't been very cooperative on this story. We've had a hard time getting his campaign to respond to our requests. Um, but it's the fact that there's a clear choice here. And it's on a subject, you know, while everyone's talking about, um, what is it, the, the self-defense law in Florida? Stand your ground, Stand your ground right. Stand, and, and all these things, which are really, really important. But it's above that is whether the state is going to be able to function. And, you know, where it's, whether their Miami is going to be underwater. And so that just, and I worry because the media, you know, where so much of the fragmented media is doing the bits and pieces, the bits and pieces. And the local reporters are, if you're a local reporter, I feel for them. You, you know, they're covering maybe five beats. They're, they're running to do this thing, running to do that thing. They don't have the time. They have to do more with less. The editors at newspapers are doing more with less. And then you have the online publications that, we, that have their own varying ways that I'm not familiar with. Um, so I worry about this, and I, I wonder who is going to um, carry the word, because I do know that unless the general public understands these things, that the political leaders will not be inspired to act. They have to be forced. I can tell you what we're doing to try to break through. And I can tell you what I tell my reporters. Um, as far as journalism is concerned now, I tell my reporters it's almost as if we are people in a forest and we're hacking a path. There's no path right now. And we're trying to find a way. You know, we're, we're building our own path and we're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna have to rejigger, but we're, we're finding our path because we're, there is no more structure. There is not the structure in place that there was at one time. And it's what I've been telling students here today. Your, your best advantage is your flexible mind, your, your best asset, so that you can help figure out the path, so that your ideas, that when, wherever you go to work, that your ideas will help navigate in this world. So, I, I tell my reporters that you are like these pioneers and you're carving out a path. But I think this same thing applies to readers too. Because I don't know about you, but I can't possibly keep up with the reading that I should do. I feel that I'm being bombarded all the time. I feel guilty all the time because of the articles I haven't read. If I read everything I should read, I would never stand up. I would never talk to anyone on the phone. I would never edit a story. Um, and being a journalist, it's a little easier for me to prioritize, you know, 
but I, I think of people, um, ordinary people, who are living busy lives, just trying to get by, getting the kids off to school, going to jobs, paying the mortgage, doing all the things that we all do to survive in a very complex society. And I wonder, how, how do I make them read this story? And my reporters and I, we talk about this in a way, it's like um, I, I said to someone, it's, it's like um, my dog carrying around a bone, or not a bone, but his uh, stuffed animals. He has these stuffed animals and he loves them. And he will carry his stuffed animal with him and he'll chew it, he'll shake it, he'll throw it in the air, and then when he's tired, he'll take it over on the sofa and he'll put his head on the stuffed animal and he'll sleep on it. And in a sense, for us in my group, and I suspect for many other serious journalism organizations now, that's what we're doing and we're thinking to ourselves, how can we get our message out? And I can tell you a few of the things we've tried. Um, right now, the project that you see up there, Something's Foul in the Eagle Ford, it's a story about gas and oil drilling in Texas where the wells are very close together. They have thousands and thousands of wells, but they're not really monitoring the air. And it's not even just the wells, but the trucks and everything, and the air pollution is a real problem. Uh, people describe to us there are, when they wake up in the morning, there's a film on their car windshield that they have to peel off. And I don't, it's not a good thing. I always think anything that's peeled onto my car windshield, I don't want in my lungs. Um, but the people there are sort of the detritus, I think. They're not, they don't, they're, they don't have a voice. It's a rural part of Texas. They don't have a lot of political clout. And they're very um, self-sufficient people and don't tend not to complain. Some are getting wealthy. It's, and, and there are great benefits. This is not an anti-drilling, uh, this series is not, there should be no drilling. But what it is, is a, is, a, is a plea to say, here are the facts. If you're going to drill, you, we need to take care of people. We need to do, be doing studies. We need to do the air monitoring, and so on and so forth. So we did that. We did the story that we won the Pulitzer Prize for. It was called The Dilbert Disaster. And we decided. It was a story about an oil spill in Michigan in 2010 in the Kalamazoo River, and a pipeline broke open, and it dumped more than a million gallons of Canadian tar sands oil into the Kalamazoo River. It still has not been all the way cleaned up today. This is 2014. And what happened was, after they, this pipeline broke open, they discovered Usually, the, the, the U.S. knows how to clean up oil spills. There's been a lot of experience, and they have skimmers and all of the stuff, and they skim it up. Well, what they found with this dilbit is, dilbit is bitumen. It's a heavy Canadian oil, and it's called diluted bitumen because it's diluted with natural gas liquid so it can flow through the pipeline. Well, when the pipeline cracked open, the liquids evaporated and the stuff became heavy again and sank, and, but no one knew it. The EPA that was on site, they had no idea what was happening at the time. Uh, the company, I think they said they were surprised, and, and they may have been, and at first they thought everything was going great, and I think it may be in a week into it, and someone goes out into the water, and um, they think everything is clearing up because they've been scooping off the top because it takes a while for the stuff to uh, dissipate. And so they were able to get a lot off. And then they start walking and then all of a sudden black stuff starts bubbling up from the bottom. And then they realize they had a problem. So to tell that story though, if we'd written that as a traditional um, story, it would have been a real heavy slog that you probably would not have read. And so we wrote some news stories, but we decided we want to tell this so that we can bring busy people. People, I always think people who are very smart, but who are pressed for time and would like to relax a little and have something that compels them to read, not just I have to read it, but that I want to read it. So we wrote it as a tale. 
and it opens with a family and we went back and recreated everything that happened. We interviewed the EPA workers, we interviewed all kinds of people along the way. When did you see the oil? What happened? And people, one man whose life, he never went back to his house. It, he was the closest, we think. And his house he had lived in there for 20 some years. That was the end. They never could live in their house again. So, so we did this story, but Little, it was, things were published, an environmental public uh, group published something about it, and there were little news reports, but the news reports were, you know, there was an oil spill, nobody died, so right away it's, okay, now I can think about something else because nobody died. Um, so it went away, and the only reason we did that story was because we sent a young reporter out to Nebraska and the Dakotas to talk, to talk to people about the Keystone XL pipeline. And she's a scientist. She has a degree from MIT. She's very, very smart. And people kept asking her, we heard about that spill up in Michigan and we want to know what would happen if there was a spill here? What would it do to us? Would it get into our aquifer? Because they're very dependent on the Ogallala aquifer. And so she went back home and thought, okay, I'm a scientist, I will look up all the research and I will write a story and answer the question for these ranchers and farmers, many of whom had lived there, they, they were survivors or descendants of Dust Bowl survivors, and their whole goal is to pass their land along to their children. It's a different culture uh, for many of them. So. She came back and there wasn't anything. And so because of those people, that's why we started writing the Dilbert disaster. But the scary thing is that it wasn't on anyone's radar. And even when we wrote it, and even after we won the Pulitzer, it's still, you know, it's still an unknown. Because how, this, it comes back to this question, how on these important issues, that involve our climate, because that is also a climate issue. How, how do we reach people? So another story that we did was, uh, and we put this out in book form, and the same with the Dilbert disaster is, a, a, is available on Amazon. Um, we did a story called Clean Break. We sent a reporter to Germany, and you know, Germany has vowed to get off fossil fuels and there's been a lot written about this. And, he, and once again, our idea was we want ordinary people to read this so that this is a pleasure to read, but it's packed with information. It's a great book. It was, it was a joy to edit. He's a great writer. And, um, but you see that the thing that I learned is Germany started on this in the 70s. And do you know why? Because of Jimmy Carter, which is uh, there was a re revelation the, to me that these German leaders of this movement were telling Osha Gray Davidson, our reporter, that uh, they watched Jimmy Carter. Those of you who are old enough during the gas crisis in the 70s and Jimmy Carter went on TV and he had a sweater on and he, he put uh, solar panels on the White House and he said we should all conserve and he's been ridiculed by, about that forever. And, but the Germans, the Germans saw that and they thought, well, that's a very American thing. We should do this too. And they took it real seriously. And Carter had started up um, an agency that was working on green technology and things. And so that was all abandoned later on. And so the Germans bought some of the technology. So, it was a real eye-opener, and I think the book is entertaining. It's a different kind of book to read. It's not traditional journalism. The same thing, we just did one about Michael Bloomberg, who was the most unusual person. And even in New York, people either love Michael Bloomberg or hate Michael Bloomberg. But, and it's called uh, Bloomberg's Hidden Legacy. And the reason it's his hidden legacy is he did more than probably any mayor in America to prepare his city for climate change. And they, they're climate experts around the world 
look to New York as an example, even though it's not in great shape. <laughs> That doesn't mean that they've found the solution. And he, so what we decided to do is we thought if we could make this a sort of an interesting book to read and we could take it from the beginning when he sort of realizes he's not a natural climate person, you know, he's, he had to be brought over. So if we could show his, that and then we could show all the things he did and the pivot points in his push then we would have a book that maybe would inspire other mayors. Um, so you see Bloomberg, he, he has faces pushback, it's bad. He goes forward because he doesn't really care. He's, you know, he, he says, okay, we're gonna, I don't care what they say, we're gonna do this anyway. Uh, people say, no, you shouldn't. He said, yes, we're going to. And how he supports his people. And it doesn't um, glorify Bloomberg, he's very much, in the background of the book, but it shows what a leader can do. And so we put that book out. So I'm gonna conclude, I, I wanna ask, take your questions, but the one thing I wanna end with is my group, like other journalism organizations throughout the country, I'm sure, we're gonna do everything we can to make people understand through all kinds of stories the need to take action on climate change. We don't editorialize, nothing we do is opinion, but climate change is in every story, just about anything that has to do with energy, anything. So we will work as hard as we can. And I know all these other journalism groups are working as hard as they can. And I'm assuming that you all are reading and doing what you can and helping your children become uh, good news consumers. And we're all doing so, say here, we're all doing everything we can. Um, but in the back of this, for this one subject, which is climate change, there's a ticking clock. And I don't, I was trying to come up with some very positive end to this. Um, and I'm not sure that journal, I know journalism will, there, something will settle out. Journalism has been through upheavals before. Something will come along, something that may be in development right now while I'm talking that I don't know about. And journalism will figure itself out and we'll all do that. But what I'm not sure about is whether we'll have a better news distribution system in time to stop some of the ravages of climate change. And so to that, I, I just say, sort of say good luck to all of us, you know, I, the best I can say.